the mass spec data, let's, um, let's start out by taking a look at the flame ionization detector, just to, uh, almost as a quick review. The idea of the FID is that there's a, there's a charge between these two plates, and there's a little hydrogen flame here. I have the hydrogen flame shown as a red dot. The hydrogen flame actually is invisible. The, the hydrogen burns so cleanly that there's, it's completely invisible. If you see a gas chromatograph and you see a little mirror next to it, or like a stainless steel spoon, you know it's an FID because the operator determines whether the flame is lit or not by putting a little mirror over it and looking for the vapors. Kind of one of the one of the little inside things about the FID. Anyway, the so as the analytes come through this space, they are ignited by the hydrogen flame. They turn into ions, and the ions go flying off into their respective corners. The positives go to the negative plate. The negatives go to the positive plate, and a current is formed. And the current is our signal. In the old days. The analog signal was run into an analog physical device, i.e. a strip chart recorder. And the strip chart recorder made up a, a, a peak on a, line, uh, on a piece of paper, and that was the signal. In today's modern world of computers, we want to make the signal into a computer useful signal. In order to do that, we need a time interval. Let's pick a tenth of a second. So after a tenth of a second, the signal will be turned into a number. The next tenth of a second, the signal will be turned into a number. The next tenth of a second, the signal will be turned into a number, etc., etc. And you'll end up with a series of numbers, 10 numbers per second. 10 seconds would be 100 numbers, etc. I pick a tenth of a second as an arbitrary value. I think a tenth of a second would probably be good enough. You could do a, a thousand a second, probably, or even maybe ten thousand a second. But a tenth of a second should be good enough for our purposes here. So then the idea of the computer is to take these numbers and group them in some fashion and um, look at the slopes. So what is the slope doing? Well, the slope's going up. Slope's going up, but kind of slowing down. The up slope's going from a positive slope to zero, and then do a negative slope, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's not too hard to figure out that this is possible. Take the signal, make it into numbers. The computer people write software to help us sort through all this. Okay, let's look at the quadrupole. The quadrupole is designed by computer engineers. They say, okay, let's filter for mass 35. Okay, now let's filter for mass 36. Okay, now let's filter for mass 37. Well, how about mass 38? How about mass 39? All the way up to mass 500. That's the first second. Now the second second, same as the first second. Let's start with mass 35, then do 36, and then go all the way to 500. Now we're on the third second. Well, I, th I think the point is clear, is that the, the, the engineers have it designed so that the mass spec will, will filter selectively, and it's programmable by the operator, but from about 35 to about 500 is the 8270. And these numbers are dropped into boxes. The engineers have designed the filter to match up the boxes in a very reproducible fashion. So that in a very quick amount, in a very short amount of time, the, the mass spec produces an absolutely incredibly large amount of data. So how does the calibration work? Well, the calibration is pretty much like other calibrations. We, we give it a standard and we say, okay, we want this to be the standard. And then the boxes are lined up according to the standard. I think that it works a little bit like calibrating your bathroom scale. You get home from the gym and you know with your clothes on you weigh 190. You get on your bathroom scale and it says 196. So you say, well, that's not right. 
And you turn the little dial till it says 190. You get off the scale, you get back on, it says 190. You know you do, in fact, weigh 190. So you assume that all the other weights line up appropriately. I think the mass spec works the same way. We give the mass spec PFTBA and then we say match the boxes that we have with this known and all the boxes line up. I've been operating a mass spec for many years and the, the, the calibration of the masses is not much of a problem. I'm not going to say I've never seen a problem with it, but it's not much of a problem. The routine of the mass spec operator is to is to tune the mass spec every morning. It just, just takes a few minutes. But the, the truth is, it's, it's really not much of a problem. The, the, um, the equipment is very robust and very... Um, you need to watch it, but it, it's not much of a problem. This representation is about 1 800th of the size of a true mass spec 8270 analysis. The, the analysis, the 80... The GC mass spec produces about a page of numbers every second. And there's about 3,000 seconds in 50 minutes, which is the 8270 run. So that the, the 8270 produces a, a stack of papers about maybe about this tall, something like that. It's, it's like a, just a staggering amount of data. Let's turn our attention to this graphic. On the bottom, we have time. And along the side, we have the mass, so that the scans go along this direction. And then a given ion is on this direction. So a typical ion, like for example, this might be the 70 ion. This might be the 194 ion, or something like that. The data is very complicated, of course. Computers are good at things like this, however. We can cut the data up kind of any way we want using the computer. Let's say if we slice it up this way, we're basically looking at specific chromatograms of specific ions. So let's take um, a look at the, um, at the 2-fluorophenol. Two 2-fluorophenol two is in black in this drawing. 2-fluorophenol has a 112, a 92, and a 64. These ions match up for their chromatogram. It's like the chromatogram of the 112 is the same as the chromatogram for 92. Okay, moving forward, in pink we have regular phenol. Phenol has a, an ion of 94 and an ion at 66. Let's look at the 2-methylphenol and the 4-methylphenol in blue and red. 2-methylphenol and 4-methylphenol, of course, are similar molecules. They don't have the same retention time, but close. They don't have the same spectrum, but it's close. But as you can see from looking at the, the blue one and the red one, they're really quite different by, from the mass spec. And the mass spec doesn't have any problem at all separating these two. The quantitation is done with an ion that has been picked by the operator. So if you pick the 107 for the blue and the 108 for the red, you can quantitate them and separate them. It's not a slice problem. And then the last one in this example, one of the internal standards we use is dichlorobenzene D4. And it's in green here. It's, it's our first internal standard. And it has an ion at 78, an ion at one. 15 and an ion at 150. The total ion chromatograph is sort of the, the overall gas chromatography is the total ion chromatograph. It would be analogous to the FID for regular GC. It's kind of like the regular GC application. And you can see it from this model from this side. You can see here we've got two peaks that are close but not the same. And then this one is by itself. And then the 2-methyl and the 4-methyl phenol, again, are close, but they're 
but but they're not the same. The, the 2-methyl and the 4-methyl do not coelude, but they're close. And then the 1,4-dichlorobenzene D4 makes a nice even peak. But you, you can see the chromatogram from this side. Let's look at a real-world application of mass spectrometry for the 8270. We have here, this is the, the total ion chromatograph, it's called, along the bottom, which is, it's, it's like the trace if it was an FID. Everything kind of added up is on the bottom. We have these three peaks that are sort of semi coeluted and we're thinking, what are these three peaks? Are they properly separated? Do we have a problem with our chromatography? We think the first one is phenol. We know that phenol has an ion, it's 66 and 94. Okay, up here we have 94 and we have 66. So 94 has a nice big peak. 66, you see it has a shoulder here. I mean, I would call that shoulder a pretty big, that's a pretty big peak actually. So this looks like phenol based upon the ions. Okay, the middle one we think is aniline. Aniline, we'd be looking at 66 and 93. So 66, perfect. And 93, notice 93 is a double peak, but it's got a nice distinct peak matching up with this peak here. And then the last one is bis-2-chloroethyl ether. We'd be looking for 63 and 93. So let's see what we've got here. Okay, 63 nice big peak, 93, nice big peak. So that pretty well tells us that these three peaks are phenol, aniline, and bis-2-chloroethyl ether. Notice the, um, notice the 94. We have a nice big peak here for 94. Notice the 93. We got these two very distinct peaks. The 94 doesn't show up on the 93 at all, and the 93 doesn't show up on the 94 at all. The quadrupole mass spec has no problem whatever separating the 93 from the 94. It's, it's pretty amazing. So now, instead of looking at it by time, we're looking at it by specific um, Instead of, instead of by time, it's at a time. So at a certain time, we say, what is the spectrum at this location? What is the spectrum at this location? And you get things like this. This is the first internal standard, which is 1,4-dichlorobenzene D4. This is the first surrogate, which is 2-fluorophenol. Uh, this mass spectrum are usually pretty messy. And the, the, the peaks coalute. And of course, if you pick one spectrum with a coaluting peak, you're going to get, the, spe the spectrums are going to be mixed together. So the standard procedure is to pick the spectrum you want, pick a representation of the garbage, and then subtract the spectrum. And then it's, it, this is all right-click function, typically. And then when you, when you get the one you want, do a library search, again, as a, as a right-click click function, and it'll tell you what it is. Depending on how the software is set up, it'll typically give you like up to 20 possibilities with a probability match according to each one. You can print them out or you know just look at them and see what it is. If you have an unknown that, that, you, um, that you're trying to figure out what it is. Mass spec interpretation is, it's not, it's not an it's straightforward as you might think. You might say, well, you have the mass spectrum of it. You know what it is. Um, sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. The, the mass spec interpretation can be complicated in its own right. And, of course, that's out of the topic of this video. So, um, thank you.